Welcome back to Echo Ridge. Today we have a little small side mission to go on. I've been staring at the screen for, I don't know, about two hours waiting for this tank to keep filling up with hydrogen, which wouldn't take long at all if this five tons of solid hydrogen ice would melt. Unfortunately, in that time, it's only gone down by 0.1 degrees. But to tell you the truth, it doesn't really matter that much. The ESS Larry here, still has about a tank and a little bit more fuel to go. In fact, they can still go another 19 tiles. The ESS Mo can go 18 tiles. Now the ESS Curly is pretty much bone dry and only has a range of six tiles remaining. And that's because it went out to the furthest part and then came all the way back. But today I think we're gonna go take a look over at Scorchado. Scorchado has the Niobium Volcano, and probably an artifact for us. And while I don't plan on necessarily taming the Niobium Volcano, there's always some solid Niobium sitting around. We're gonna grab it and turn it into Thermium. I also wanted to give you an update on our enriched uranium production. If you remember from last episode, there may have been some mistakes made where, you know, we exterminated all the bees. But because I already had 39 tons worth of enriched uranium, I figured it wouldn't hurt to do it the slow and painful way. And that's by using the uranium centrifuge. I remember the bees gave us a much better conversion factor than what the uranium centrifuge does. We put 10 kilos worth of uranium ore in and we're only gonna get two kilos worth of enriched uranium out. And then eight kilos of liquid uranium, which when it gets cooled down, turns into depleted uranium. The enriched uranium comes out right in front of the centrifuge. The liquid depleted uranium gets emptied out here in this vent, which is also being used by this liquid shutoff to make sure that there's enough steam inside the room. And unfortunately, we've discovered another sort of lock type, and that is the nuclear waste on top of uranium lock. So I'm gonna have to clean this up a little bit. What's happening is all the nuclear waste that's coming out of the reactor is then mixing with the uranium coming out of the vent and just sort of stacking on itself. Not really ideal at all. But I figure that's a problem for future Echo. Now the ESS Mo is pretty much ready. We have 35 tons worth of oxalite, 100 basic rad pills and 340,000 calories, which should be plenty. So we're gonna go ahead and crew up the rocket. I'm gonna make sure the Trailblazer module is good and I do see the Trailblazer lander there. And then we also have Rover and Rover's Lander inside Rover's module as well. We can take everybody's suits off. Don't worry, we'll stack them where they go in just a moment. And I really should have remembered to put the Atmos suit checkpoint in before I took all their suits out. All right, everybody back in their suits. All right, that took an exceptionally long amount of time. So we're going to go ahead and recrew up the ESS Mo, set our destination over here to Scorchito, make sure everybody's aboard. And away we go. Hopefully this time not destroying anything on the rocket platform. Look at that. Everything's working just fine. While those duplicates are en route, I wanted to give you an update on our Moo farm. This gassy Moo is new. You can see that they are only three cycles old. Their name is Manny. And the Moos have been doing pretty good except for one minor thing. They keep getting stuck again. I've managed to solve the problem a little bit. By putting a door here that the duplicates will occasionally go through in order to get down here, it allows the door to open and lets the gassy moo not be entombed. It's even happened here on this corner as well. I don't know if there's a better way to make sure that the, they are not getting stuck, but it has to something to do with their destination. In this one, it's normally when they're coming or leaving the milking station, and in this tile here, it's normally when they're coming to eat this specific gas grass, which means the problem lies on the left side because they haven't gotten stuck on this tile yet or this tile. I wanted to make sure you noted that so in case you designed a gassy moo ranch, you try to keep the single left tiles all flat because having to deconstruct a tile and rebuild it every few cycles because the cows got stuck can be somewhat annoying. Just like having this liquid chlorine breaking the pipes. I'm working on this as well. In other news, we've collected quite a bit of Brackeen, which means we can start getting working on Brax Wax. Now, just like everything else in the game, apparently the Brax Wax Cleaner creates 8,000 DTUs worth of heat, 
and it also requires 480 watts, so we'll be building it out of steel as well, and placing it somewhere in our sauna. Now you may have noticed that they do have an output and an input, which actually creates some problems, because that means we have to take all that bracken that we've been milking and inject it directly into the brack wax cleaner. And my guess is the brax wax is gonna come out as a solid, but the brine is gonna come out as a liquid through this port here, which isn't a big deal. We'll just go ahead and dump it with all the rest of the liquids in here, and it'll tie in perfectly with our existing system because once the liquid shut off and the automation of this Atmo sensor detects too much steam, it just pushes all the rest of the liquid out. The other issue that we're gonna be having is the fact that Bracken flashes into brine at 80 degrees. And as I'm sure you already know, it is well beyond 80 degrees in here. In fact, because of that, maybe we don't put the Brax Wax Gleaner in here. We just happen to have a nice little area that the bees are no longer using for one reason or another, and since they vacated their homes, we can put the Brax Wax Cleaner right here. And since we have a cooling loop here, the heat being generated by the Brax Wax Cleaner won't really matter too much. We don't have to worry about it getting too cold because Bracken doesn't actually freeze until minus 16 and a half. While we're getting that set up, I think we're also gonna send out the ESS Larry. We have an available range of 19 tiles. So I'd like to figure out what this little object here is and it's only nine tiles away. Welcome aboard again, Angry. Our destination is now set. We have once again sealed off the hydrogen tank. That way, none of the heat will be injected into it. And we can now launch the Larry. And fingers crossed with the launching of Larry, we haven't broken anything again. And apparently, yes, everything is looking good. We haven't broken anything again this time. Without much fanfare, the Brax Wax Cleaner is creating Brax Wax. I didn't realize because, you know, failure to follow simple instructions, Along with the heat, the brine, and the brack wax, the brax wax cleaner also creates carbon dioxide, which I don't really care about the carbon dioxide other than the fact that it will reduce the effectiveness of the cooling loop. We have a pneumatic door here and all that carbon dioxide will just sort of float out here and anytime they open this door, it'll vent. I'll keep an eye on it though. It could create more problems. All the duplicates are in suits up here anyways. And Sleet Wheat does not care if it's in a carbon dioxide environment. Our Brax Wax Cleaner has produced 15 kilos worth of Brax Wax and now says it requires emptying. Oh, isn't that adorable? I have no idea what they're emptying out of it, but it definitely doesn't look good. Oh, they were emptying more Brax Wax. I wasn't sure if it was going to be something like a desalinator, but I suppose that's where we get the Brax Wax from. And if you look close enough, you can sort of see it collecting in there. With our new Brax Wax, when we click on a transit tube, you're gonna see that there's a button called Enable Smooth Ride, which apparently allows us to grease up the tubes to make it faster. Apparently enabling the smooth ride is gonna require 10 kilos worth of brack wax. And once it was dropped off, you can see there's a little change in the graphic for the transit tube. This one here has the smooth ride. This one does not. You can see the little meter here is empty. It does look like it's pretty efficient though because it only requires 50 grams per use. So your 10 kilos gives you 200 rides. Now I want to find out what the actual speed boost is. It took a couple of tries because they were going so fast, but Mr. DK Oz here just left that same transit tube entrance. And you can see they now have the smooth rider buff. And it ends up boosting their transit tube travel speed by 25%. Not too bad. The other thing we're going to be able to do with the Brack Wax is create plastium. Plastium is going to be good in places where you'd want to use plastic, but it's too hot. For instance, inside the nuclear sauna. And we'll be able to make the plastium by using brack wax, plastic, and thermium. So I'm looking forward to playing around with it in a little while as well. But first, we need to get some niobium. Speaking of which, the ESS Mo is in orbit right now. So step one, we will deploy the rover. Uh, I don't know exactly where we're going to be able to deploy the rover. Since it doesn't look like this is going to be an area that we're going to be able to dig down through without submerging a duplicate inside magma, it looks like this is going to be the entrance. But unfortunately, this is only 27 tiles high. Boy, is this going to be a pain. We're going to have to land here and then build ladders out of the obsidian just to be able to get in and out of the rocket, not to mention the fact that we have to get up over here as well. 
All right, this is already not going as planned. Apparently, there's no connection from this obsidian down to this one. Well, this is going to be problematic. And poor Rover can't dig out obsidian either. They can at least deconstruct their own lander. And Carol is not going to like me in a little bit. So I had the idea of creating a targeting beacon, and that way we could just ship the materials down here. Unfortunately, we have no way to build the targeting beacon. I can get Carol to land here, but remember, you're on a clock. You have to be able to build ladders to be able to get Carol back inside the rocket. Now, we can play games by shifting the spacefarer module down so it doesn't take as many ladders and that sort of thing, but it'd be really nice to have some more materials here. Hi, Carol. You've got Blue Cross Blue Shield, right? Sorry about this. All right. Well, we now have enough for the rocket platform once we deconstruct the Trailblazer module. I suppose we can deconstruct a little bit of the obsidian right off the edges here, and that magma should actually disappear into the vacuum. Actually, it does look like there is a background there, so that won't work either. We are squeezing the rocket platform over as far as possible. We'll have rovers start building some ladders out of the obsidian. And because I can't exactly put Carol inside the magma to hide from the rocket, she's just going to have to deal with the rocket exhaust coming down on her head. Sorry about that. Ooh, that, that's got a sting. Oh yeah, that's got a sting. I'm surprised Carol's not melted. Okay, there's the scalding message. And now we're just going to do the cheeky little trick where we just keep dropping, so that way we don't have to build as many ladders. Some other things we have to worry about here on Scorchito is the massive amount of radiation and the amount of light coming down on this planetoid. You can see from the star map that it has 375 rads and 100,000 lux. I'm going to try deconstructing some more of this obsidian. I'm sure Carol is going to be thrilled about the opportunity. Oh, they are already really scalded, aren't they? Maybe we won't let them get in the magma. No, no, you can go back up. We're going to let them heal a little bit. But I did want to at least put a couple of obsidian tiles here to block a little bit of that radiation as we try to figure out how in the world we're going to get all the way down here. I'm starting by building a couple of ladders here because I can strip mine a lot of this obsidian without fear. Well, with a little bit of fear. Some other things I have to remember to do is put a gas vent out here. Luckily enough, we had a little bit of copper ore sitting inside the rocket, and we're going to have to use some of this valuable obsidian to be able to connect it to the gas vent. The other problem we're going to run into is, well, our battery's now dead. Yeah, we have plenty of lux going to this one solar panel module, but it's only 60 watts. The ESS Mo requires a little bit more power than that, not only to keep the suits charged, but run the gas filter and the gas pump. This won't be a big deal as soon as I can get a little platform going and we can put a duplicate wheel on. And in order to save on materials, we can also lower this battery a bunch. And now we have access to the power port. And just like that, we now have power again. And because duplicate safety is our number one priority here at Echo Ridge Gaming, we made sure they're not going to be irradiated to death. We've managed to make some progress, grabbing a little obsidian here, a little obsidian there, and are now going to have access to view this entire area. And yeah, the news is all bad. I was really hoping this side of the obsidian was connected somehow. Sadly, it's not. So at this point, there's a couple of options. One is to sort of tunnel our way down, trying to keep as much magma out of the tunnel as possible. Or two, empty all the magma. I don't have to tell you how much of a pain it would be to empty all of this magma. So instead, I think we're going to try the tunnel method. And to start off with, we're going to push all of this magma over. Now, when duplicates are running through this little bit of magma, it doesn't really matter too much, as long as they're not sitting there swimming in it. And Rover doesn't care either. Rover can go all the way up to 2400 degrees because Rover is made of steel. And just like that, the magma pops up and then disappears into the vacuum of space. Don't ask me where it goes, it just disappears. Now I'm looking down here and seeing how much pressure there is, because what's going to happen is I'll be able to corner build this block, but I won't be able to put another block down until I get rid of this tile. But as soon as I do, this magma is going to sort of shoot up our wonderful little shaft here. But if I play my cards right, I might be able to destroy the magma as it rises in level. You used to be able to use the door trick, and that'd be by using some mechanized airlocks, turning them sideways, and the duplicate could actually build through the door. Well, that doesn't work anymore. 
We've revealed more of the area, and there is our wonderful artifact. What are you? It's a honey jar. But more importantly, we want this niobium. Because once you get a little bit of niobium, you have all the niobium you ever need. I'll show you more of that a little bit later. Another problem is, well, it's a thousand degrees. I mean, we could always just have Rover do all this, right? Rover doesn't care about swimming in the magma. Alright, so at least we have something going for us. We have a shaft, now we just have to get rid of this amount of magma. And because things weren't going bad enough, we are already radiation vomiting. And yes, we still have all of our basic rad pills. Some of the things we have to contend with, along with the radiation vomiting, because I realized I didn't cover this shaft that everybody had been working in, is things like the manual generator breaking. This is not too big of a deal, it's just gonna be a manual process of deconstructing it and rebuilding it. So this isn't too bad, and you can sort of guess what's gonna happen. We have an obsidian pitcher pump in here, and we just have to pump out four tons worth of magma. And we'll pump them right into these obsidian bottle emptiers, in which the magma will land here and quickly disappear. Enabling auto bottle and copy those settings. And it's a little bit of magic. I would have preferred not having to do this, and we're gonna have to do it a little bit more down here. But the alternative is emptying out the entire planetoid. And nobody has time for that. Least of all me, because we just want some niobium. One thing I should have remembered was to bring some spare suits. Not only did I not bring that, I also didn't bring any reed fiber to be able to repair said suits. Fun fact about Rover, they can actually use the pitcher pump. Doesn't have an animation, but there's Rover's big bottle of magma. So unfortunately, the targeting beacon requires a refined metal, which leaves me the option of taking away something that's in here, or just launching enough payloads from Toxedo that eventually one of them lands in a place that our duplicates can get to. I don't know. I mean, it's not a great idea, but we're gonna try it anyways. Reed fiber, let's say 20 kilos worth. With our 20 kilos worth of reed fiber loaded up, all we have to do is launch them. It takes 80 rad bolts to get to Scorchado, not a big deal. But our minimum launch mass right now is 200 kilos. So I think we just gotta reduce this to say 20, clear it, reselect the destination, and off goes our reed fiber. And as luck would have it, the payload landed right here on top of the obsidian. Now all we have to do is manually empty it, then we'll have access to reed fiber. Now we're gonna do the same exact thing, except this time we're gonna throw a little bit of steel in here. I'm gonna say, what, maybe a ton? Because getting the reed fiber is only half the battle. We're also gonna need an exosuit for it to be able to actually repair the suits. All right, this isn't too bad. Out of five shipments, three of them landed in the magma, and two of them landed up here. With that little bit of steel, we'll be able to put in our exosuit forge and once again rebuild the manual generator. We've also managed to make it down a little bit further, and this one's going to be a lot easier depending on which way this magma pushes. We may be able to just destroy it with the blocks. Unfortunately, we were just a smidge too late, because all four Atmos suits have been worn out. Well, you know what that means. I hope you can hold your breath, dupes. And don't worry, this is all legit. Both Dave and Lady Ruff have a lot of experience working in inhospitable atmospheres without Atmos suits. We didn't get lucky with the magma, but it's not a big deal. We're just going to keep building it up and up and up until, once again, we can grab it with the pitcher pump. All right, Andy, I have no idea how you ended up in here. My guess is they were leaning down on one of these ladders and the Krabby Boys started attacking them there. Without too much fuss, we now have four perfectly good suits. And I say not too much fuss, but it probably took us about five more cycles than this trip should have. Learning is occurring. And just like that, we've now built all the blocks back up so we have access to the magma. That will be it. We finally hit the main part of this planetoid and are about to go hog wild. Now the question remains, how am I going to transport 1000 degree niobium? Remember when we showed the niobium earlier and it was super, super hot? Well, so far it's lost about 200 degrees. And a lot of things happen this way in the game because when the game is built, all the tiles are put into place and everything sort of stays that way until the player reveals it. Once the tiles are revealed, everything starts to interact with each other. In this case, all this niobium is interacting with the 800 degree obsidian that it's sitting next to. Not that there's a big difference between 800 degree niobium and 1000 degree niobium, but 
I've got a plan. Before I forget, we also need to put down our wonderful mini pod. Not that it matters anymore for the achievement, because we've already put mini pods on at least five colonies, but I still like to do it on every colony that we've landed on. Speaking of which, this planetoid is actually our ninth. We only have two more planetoids to land on to complete Cluster Conquest. So apparently the last two are really Chilios and Socorillin. Now this is going to take a little bit of time because the only person who can dig through the Obsidian or the Abyssalite is Carol. We're also going to go in here, grab this wonderful artifact. We'll put in the Move To command just like we did last time, even though it is sitting at 356 degrees. That'll be okay, especially if I correctly prepare for it by canceling the move too <laughs> and putting it inside of our little polluted water bath. That will cool that down a little bit. As for the niobium, I have a different idea. And now that we've discovered niobium, I'm going to try this trick out. What we're going to do is take all this niobium and start building some metal tiles out of it. And now our niobium metal tile is 45 degrees. And when we deconstruct it, it's going to land on this wonderful insulated tile that is also 45 degrees. Unfortunately, I can't build a metal tile out of a honey jar. And the honey jar is sitting at 535 degrees since I dropped it off its pedestal. So that, we're going to try using the polluted water bath. Now this is still going to be a very manual process because once I do have the cool niobium, I have to select it and move it inside the rocket. And now I have to figure out how to make sure they don't touch that niobium again. Well, I probably should have thought through that one. As soon as the blue water touched these 1400 degree obsidian tiles, well, it turned into sand and our honey jar is still just as hot. Let's just move it inside and see what happens. The honey jar is not too big, so it shouldn't be able to transfer its thermals too bad. Oh, I figured out an even better method. Instead of making metal tiles, we'll make niobium temperature shift plates and that'll be 800 kilos a pop. Just as soon as Carol wants to dig up more niobium, so the good news is that the honey jar is inside the rocket. The bad news is it's draining all of its temperature, which means it is conducting inside of here. On the good news front though, the honey jar is only 25 kilos. So I'm pretty sure we can absorb 25 kilos worth of 400 degree temperature throughout the interior of this cabin. I think we've done a fairly decent job of getting through here. We could go get more niobium, but again, there's not a really big point. Now I've swept all the niobium into here. So hopefully when I kick it out of the storage bin and say, hey, let's build another temperature shift plate out of niobium, that they choose to use this pile since it's so close. They keep wanting to grab the niobium that's already in the rocket. Why? Because, well, they're in the rocket. And there they go again. No. But right now it has a move to command. So if I set this up, maybe somebody else will get an errand to go and grab this one. Yes. Perfect. And then we'll do the same thing again. Move it inside the rocket, and while that Aaron is queued up, we will also build another temperature shift plate out of niobium. My little tricks are not working, so I think we're just going to suck it up. This is 1000 degree niobium at 240 kilos. We're going to move it inside the rocket, but onto the existing pile of 45 degree niobium. So it should average pretty nicely for us in our favor. Okay, it's 161 degrees. That probably wasn't the smartest thing I've ever done, but as long as we get home pretty quickly, maybe we'll also replace this tile with an obsidian insulated tile too. I am going to deconstruct these buildings before we go because I don't want to see broken building. Warnings for the rest of the game. We're going to deconstruct the power and we've got everybody crewed up and ready to go. We'll acknowledge those warnings. I'm sure they're not important and begin our launch sequence. Now, while we do need to hurry to get home, we're going to take a quick stop over by the obsolete space station module and grab its artifact. I'd like to take a moment and recognize the fact that these four duplicates made that entire trip, grabbed all the niobium, may have had a couple of upset stomachs due to some, you know, random radiation issues, and did it all with 0% stress. Now, granted, if I don't get the niobium out of this rocket here soon, they're not going to be happy. We've already raised the inside of the cabin by about 15 degrees. And look at this. It only took a month of Sundays, but the hydrogen ice finally melted. We even have a tank with over two tons of hydrogen in it. Yeah, some of the pipes are not doing great because I was foolish and lowered the temperature because I was trying to melt all that debris. Now it should have enough chill to make it all the way through. And look at those filled up rockets already. 
But more importantly, we now have our niobium here. And when we take our niobium with a little bit of tungsten, we can turn it into thermium. And remember when I told you that we wanted to save all that wolframite? And here's the reason why. Because we take all that wolframite and we turn it into tungsten. And look, I feel bad for showcasing everything we're doing with the niobium while the nuclear sauna is this kind of a mess, but I haven't gotten around to it, okay? We will. And there's our first 100 kilos worth of tungsten. And we're gonna take 95 kilos of it, combine it with five kilos of niobium, and make a piece of thermium. And there she is. 100 kilos of arguably the best manufactured material in the game. For those who do not know, anything built out of thermium has an overheat temperature of plus 900 C. So you can really start doing tricky stuff then. And remember when I told you that once you have just a little bit of niobium, you don't need any more niobium? Here's the reason why. Because we can then take that 100 kilos worth of thermium and turn it into 100 kilos worth of niobium. So even if we do run through all of this niobium, well, we just refine some thermium back into niobium and go look for more wolframite. It's all part of the circle of life. Speaking of wolframite, mining this glimmering asteroid field will give us 60% of our cargo as wolframite. Not to mention, we haven't been to this asteroid field quite yet, which means we have another mission for the ESS Curly. All right, so we've gotten tungsten. We use that tungsten, combining it with some niobium to make thermium, in which we now understand that we can take all of that thermium and turn it back into the much more rare niobium. The last new material that we're gonna discover today is a little bit of plastium. We have our brack wax, we have plastic, and we'll combine it with 15 kilos worth of thermium, and we're gonna get some plastium. I'm gonna start off with a quick five, just so I can underscore how powerful this plastium is going to be. And there it is, beautiful plastium. Anything that you can make out of plastic, you can now make out of plastium. For instance, a regular plastic tile. Except just like the thermium, the plastium provides the plus 900 degrees. So, you wanted to put a bunch of plastic tiles inside this nuclear sauna, you could. If you wanted to make all these ladders out of plastium, you could. Now, if we wanted to put transit tubes that drop off directly inside the nuclear sauna, we could. Because we could use a transit tube crossing that wouldn't end up melting inside the sauna. Those are just a few of the cases that I can think of off the top of my head. But let me know in the comments below if you have any other ingenious ideas of what you can do with this new material. I hope you had a great time in this episode and are still enjoying the series. I'm off to give Starfield a try. As a reminder, every comment and push of the like button helps by letting YouTube know that you're still enjoying the content. Until next time, much love, happy gaming, and I'll talk to you soon.